What's up? I'm Bee, and welcome to the second installment of my series on the book To Train Up a Child by Michael and Debbie Pearl. If you have not seen part one yet, I will put a card up here as well as a link down in the pinned comments below so you can feel free to watch that part first. A lot of that was just kind of background information going over a news article um, that detailed some very tragic things that have happened uh, as a result of this book or by tragic things that have been committed by people who have read this book and believe in its teachings, I guess is a better way to say it. And we also went over some of the Bible verses that people use to justify biblical spanking. So that's all in there. We're going to hop right into chapter two and I'm going to get fired up. Before we do that though, two orders of business. As many of y'all know, I have endometriosis and I have gotten pretty stinking good at managing it, but being chronically ill, sometimes things pop up that you are not expecting or you're hoping won't happen. And that happened today. I am having a really, really rough endometriosis day. Uh, luckily, for the most part, the pain has subsided, but I am just physically exhausted from being in pain for hours at a time. So if my mood seems a little bit off or I just look tired because I feel like I look exhausted. That's why. Number two, today I am trying a wine that I have never tried before. It's from the Cupcake Lighthearted Collection, I guess if you want to call it that. It's where they have, I think, four different kinds. They have a Pinot Grigio, Chardonnay, Rosé, and Pinot Noir that are all like the lighthearted, so it's less than one gram of sugar and under 80 calories per glass, which I was like, Sounds good to me. Let's give it a shot. I tried the rosé and I was not a fan, but I've also never had rosé before, so maybe I just don't like that kind of wine. I don't know. I love a good Pinot Grigio though, so let's give it a taste. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, this tastes like a Pinot Grigio. I, I don't think it would be my first choice for the Grigio, but not bad. And, and at 80 calories a glass, I mean, I think this is probably more than five ounces, but Lower calories, low sugar, can't complain. With all that being said, let's get into chapter two where I am going to be real angry. So we're going to take kind of the same approach that we did in part one where I'm not going to read everything in chapter two to you, just the sections that really stuck out to me. It's kind of difficult because it doesn't differentiate whether it's Michael or Debbie. Um, so I'll just say the pearls, I guess, going forward. So right off the bat, we are coming in hot with the very first passage, Behold the Second Woe. Just last night, while sitting in a meeting, I looked over to see a young mother struggling with her small child. He seemed determined to make her life as miserable as possible. What? Nope, just keep reading, just keep reading, B. And destroy her reputation in the process. She had the why me look on her tired face. He kept defiantly throwing his bottle on the floor. Tells you how young this kid is, that he's drinking out of a bottle. Assisted by her picking it up and handing it back to him and making angry noises that forced the preacher to scream louder and louder. With threats of increasingly embarrassing displays, he forced her to put him down on the floor where he proceeded to audition for circus clown while insisting on procuring a neighbor's property. When she tried to prevent his thievery and rescue the stolen goods, he kicked his feet like an egg beater and screamed his protest. So you're taking a, tr a baby because he's drinking out of a bottle. You're taking a baby to a meeting where he's expected to just sit quietly for probably at least an hour, if not more. He says the preacher, so presumably this meeting is at church. Um, you would think that like, because I don't know what kind of meeting this is. If it was a regular church service, you would assume that they would have child care provided, but apparently they don't. So if you're going to have a meeting that people need to or want to go to at a church, you would think prop people would probably be okay having a baby there. I mean, I don't know, like childcare isn't always easy to come by. It's possible that this mom had a babysitter that fell through. I, I have no idea. Maybe they couldn't afford a babysitter, but still wanted to go to the meeting. Who knows? In any case, you're at a church. Like, People there should be willing to be part of the community and like help out with the baby if it's really that much of a distraction. That's just how it always was at my church. Like 
if people brought their kids, they'd let you kind of run around in the corner and have fun while they did a meeting. And obviously this is a baby, so he can't necessarily go entertain himself, but it's just like you're you're crapping on this baby for being a baby. Why don't people help? Be the church, guys. Be the hands and feet of Jesus. Pick up that kid. Try and play with the kid. Distract him. What up? Help the mom. I... Anyway, it was enough to make you believe the devil started out as an infant. Why are you demonizing children? Like, we're gonna get, it's gonna get so much worse. So let me, I am just thankful that one-year-olds don't weigh 200 pounds or a lot more mothers would be victims of homicide. It causes one to understand where the concept of a sinful nature originated. The mother knows the child shouldn't be acting like this, but due to the child's limited intellectual development, she feels helpless. Other children and adults have their actions constrained by many mental and social factors. This child is not affected by peer pressure, threat of embarrassment, or rejection. His life is one of unlimited, unrestrained self indulgence. What a selfish baby. The parents are waiting for the child's understanding to develop so they can correct bad behavior. They helplessly watch while selfishness and meanness of spirit grow behind a wall of undeveloped understanding. What is the driving force in this child and how can it be conquered? We need to understand some things about the nature of a child in order to institute appropriate training. The next section, God-given self-centeredness. For the purpose of moral development, God created us to exist in a constant condition of need and dependence. The needs are most apparent in the small child. He needs food, warmth, companionship, entertainment, and a dry diaper. God has endowed him with strong, involuntary compulsion to taste, smell, hear, with eyes to see, and a desire to touch and feel. Even if you're, like, not looking at humanity through a religious lens, I mean, humans in general, like, even if you don't have a faith system or a belief system if you're an atheist you still enjoy earthly things you like good tasting food you like hearing pleasant things seeing beautiful things so I mean it, like that's just that is human nature whether or not you believe in God the desires and passions in the infant are not yet complete as he matures he will find himself possessed of ever-increasing natural desires for things pleasant to the eyes, things good for food, and for those things that will make one wise. His growing humanity will give way to a desire to build, to know, to be appreciated, recognized, to succeed, be a lover, and survive in a secure state. As infants grow, they learn to manipulate their surroundings to their own gratification. A smile, a grunt, kicking the feet, rolling and shaking the head, crying, screaming, pick me up, Feed me. Just look at me. Doesn't anyone realize I have urgent needs? What could be more important than me? The infant's world is no bigger than his needs. It is the only reality he knows. He soon learns that his wants can be just as readily satisfied. The infant cannot think in terms of duty, responsibility, or moral choice. He has no pride or humility, only desire. You're talking about him like he is just like this massive evil person trying to take advantage of everybody around him. He comes, he sees, he takes, he is created that way. By nature, he is incapable of considering the needs of others. The baby doesn't know you are tired and also in need of comfort. Look, the fact that he's like quoting a child, what could be more important than me? Look, do, do you understand? I want Michael and Debbie, let me just throw something out at you. Have you ever heard of the basic cycle of needs? Have you? If not, let me explain, and I'll like put a graphic up here to kind of make it easier to see, but a basic cycle of needs is something that helps foster secure attachment in children and helps them grow up to thrive, to feel confident and trusting, to create healthy, long-lasting relationships. You know, it's, it's like the foundation of how they feel about their place in the world. An infant has a need. Maybe their diaper needs to be changed. Infant realizes that they're uncomfortable. They have a need. Uh, something's wrong here. They make that need known, in this case, probably by crying. The caretaker of the child hears the crying, notices, ah, my child has a need. This baby has a need. And then promptly goes to figure out what it is. Probably pretty quickly they can figure out, hmm, diaper needs to be changed. So, 
they do that. They take care of that need. The child has that need satisfied, feels relaxed, and forms trust in that caretaker, forms a bond in that caretaker, and understands that if they need something because, you know, they're a baby and they can't feed themselves or clothe themselves or go to the bathroom and they literally rely on their parents who chose to have them for survival, if they understand that they can trust that caretaker, they can develop a secure attachment and they can, you know, assuming that the caretakers are competent, loving adults, they can have a shot at thriving as they grow up because they trust people and they're, they don't become withdrawn. They don't feel as anxious. And of course, this is very simplified. There are plenty of things that can cause anxiety or shyness or not make a, or make a kid not want to interact with others, of course, obviously. But the basic building blocks of a healthy, well-adjusted child are meeting this cycle of needs. Your baby is not selfish for having needs. Your baby is not selfish or manipulating the adults around them to get what they want. They are a baby and they need you to take care of them. And it's very interesting to me because then the pearls go on to say, the self-centeredness of infants and small children has all the, all the appearances of a vice, but they are acting on natural God-given impulses to the meeting of natural needs. Then why are you demonizing them? Maybe I'm taking this like way more aggressively than they meant to write it, but that's how it came off to me the first time I read it, and that's how it's coming off to me right now. Then he goes on to quote scripture. They quote, go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies, Psalm 58, 3, yet God does not impute the lie to them as a sin. God reckons as if they had no moral character and therefore no responsibility. They do not possess the intellectual and moral maturity to say no to appetites. They cannot yet be deemed blameworthy. They begin life in an innocent self-centeredness. And that's literally just taking, that's taking scripture out of context because this, this verse is not just Every child, as soon as they be born, they're speaking lies. No. Bible study with bee time. Psalms are songs, kind of. So, like, they're kind of like epics or stories told through music, basically. And this one was written by David. He has an entire backstory, David, in the Bible. Um, has an entire backstory. And this is from before he was king. And basically, he's being persecuted. And so, he's calling into question the morality of the people who are persecuting him. And he's saying, like, have I not been moral? Have I not been a, an upstanding person? I didn't kill Saul in the cave when I could have. I could have. He's, his back was turned to me, and I could have murdered him, and he would not have even seen it coming, and I chose not to. And now you're still persecuting me and coming after me. Is essentially like the basis of where this psalm comes from. And so then if we want to look at like the verses leading up to it, it's very clear that he's not talking about every child going astray as soon as they are born. So Psalm 58, 1, this is the New International Version. Of course, there are many, many, many interpretations of the Bible. This is just the one that I like to use. It says, Do you rulers indeed speak justly? Do you judge people with equity? No, in your hearts you devise injustice, and your hands mete out violence on the earth. Even from birth the wicked go astray. From the womb they are wayward, spreading lies. So even from birth the wicked go astray. I don't want to get too hung up on semantics, but in this interpretation, it's clear that it's not just everybody, it's specific people. And then obviously if you look at verses 1 and 2, do you rulers indeed speak justly? So it's a specific group of people he's speaking to. I'm like just pissed right now, honestly. I, y'all know my pet peeve. Y'all know my pet peeve of just like throwing a verse out there and saying, see, this is what it means because this is what it says. We need to look at the bigger picture. The pearls then go on to talk about how when a child gets older, eventually parents will start to set up some boundaries and restrictions to a child's desires, not the needs, but the wants, kind of helping them understand that what they want can't always come first. Sometimes we need to wait. Sometimes the answer is no, all that. But he does also say that um, if by now, you know, at 8 to 12 months, if by now training has not already subdued the manifestations of his selfishness, the child may become, or the child may come to be what we call 
spoiled. And I guess I just want to say that I don't think you can give them enough attention that they become spoiled, right? I mean, a kid needs to know that they are loved and taken care of. At 8 to 12 months, I'm not quite sure that this is something that should really be a concern that you're giving your kid too much attention or too much leeway. Guilty, frustrated parents are manipulated by the child's whining and crying. The sparing begins. The kid gets jerked around. Resentment builds. The adult begins to blame him. And again, I don't know what kind of adult blames an 8 to 12 month old for uh, making their desires known. Does, uh, that doesn't make sense to me. Back to the book, the child feels the tension but does not lessen the demands. He connives, calculates, and resorts to angry tantrums. Totally normal. Uh, I have seen a two-year-old take a weapon and angrily strike his mother. The young child is not matured to a point where he can understand responsibility, weigh values, and make conscious decisions based on moral or social worth, but he sure can mimic the criminal mind. No, like, two-year-olds are just figuring things out. They don't necessarily have the greatest impulse control. And uh, two-year-olds hit, two-year-olds throw. It's one of those things where you just, you use that as a time to help your child begin to understand. Because at two, you can't tell your, your two-year-old morally why hitting people is wrong, right? Like, or throwing things at people is wrong. If a kid throws something at you, you can tell them, ow, that hurts. And you can explain to them why it's not appropriate and, and hope that maybe they see, oh, I, I did that and it made mommy sad or it made my friend sad. And eventually they will start to understand and develop that thought that they don't want to hurt people even if they're angry. But it's a totally normal thing for a two-year-old to throw stuff and hit people. Obviously, it's not great. Like, you don't want your kid running around socking people in the face. But it's not as if this child is mimicking the criminal mind. Uh, they then just go on to talk about how the transition from uh, wanting your child to take more responsibility, I guess, or start acting their age, you know, like learning that they can't just like take food out of people's hands. That's always a tough transition because if the kid was three months old, you would think it was funny, but if they're three, it's not appropriate. And so um, parents get resentment and kids don't understand why their parents are mad. I don't know, maybe it's just me, but if like, I have a niece who's three. If she took something out of my hand, like, if she took food out of my hand, I don't think I'd get mad. I would just be like, hey, that's not nice. Would you like some of it? Okay, ask me for a bite and I'll share some. Like, I don't know. I just don't understand this, like, getting so angry at a kid as they're learning how to be, like, a person functioning in society. He continues to go on, or I'm saying he because I'm kind of assuming it's more Michael than Debbie. I don't know, but they then go on to uh, just continue talking about it and ask, you know, how do we relate to the child during this transition period from no moral understanding to having them take complete accountability for their actions? You know, what do you do when the child is 30% morally cognizant and 70% morally naive? How do we relate to him? How do we know to what degree he is responsible? It's going to be different on like a case-by-case -case basis of how much you expect out of your kids because every kid is different. So he's like, ah, don't worry. Like if your kid passes on when they're not fully morally accountable, don't worry. You're good. God's not going to send them to hell. But also if you wait until they fully understand morality to start training them, it's going to be a problem. Moving on to parental responsibility. Here's where we come to the crux of this whole chapter and the background for this whole book. It is important to understand, all caps, parents must assume that part of the child's moral duty which is not yet fully developed. The parent's role is not that of a policeman, but more like that of the Holy Spirit. When the child has his sails full of wind, strong drives, but no compass, moral discernment, the parents must be the navigator. When they are as yet capable of conviction, our training and example will be their standards. Before they can decide to do good, we must condition them to do good. I feel like this section is kind of like fear mongering. Um, he says the parent must understand, or they, the pearls say, the parent must understand his role in the moral weaning of the child. 
One day he or she is going to be able to choose. No amount of training is going to override the certainty of sin developing, but the training we give can make it easier for repentance to follow the sinful indulgence. Like, hey, if you don't do everything in this book, like you're setting your kid up for failure, you need to get that conditioning in ASAP or else they're going to go down a dark path to hell. If you have a religion or a, a set of moral standards, as most of us do, even if we're not religious, Yes, you want to instill those values in the child because obviously at some point they're going to be able to choose how they want to act and what kind of life they want to live. But by instilling those values early, I think you kind of hope that they would follow in your footsteps and have maybe a similar belief system or similar set of standards that you do because obviously if you believe something, you think it's right and so you would want that for your kid. But I feel like that's just more of again, a moral thing rather than like conditioning them not to take glasses off your head or, or not to touch things after you say no. Like it's just very different things. Like worrying about their morality is very different from wanting a completely obedient and compliant child no matter what. Again, fear-mongering, anticipating this development and its consequences places an urgent sense of responsibility on us. The world is in an undertow, pulling our children to destruction. Looking at statistics alone, the probability is against their moral survival. What statistics? Where's the link? The training we give and the wisdom we impart can make all the difference in the outcome. You hold an eternal soul in your hand. You cannot afford to give in to indifference, laziness, or careless neglect. It is the parent's responsibility to determine what level of understanding a child has and to hold him accountable to that level. Again, it talks about like when you need to wor be worried about when a kid's actions are considered sin. Uh, in, in other words, when is a child to blame? Keep in mind that a youth will not come under condemnation until his moral faculties are fully operative. Yep, as kids get older, they can understand morality and, and they can understand um, why like saying mean things to a friend is wrong. Oh, it's not nice and it hurt their feelings. I don't want to hurt the feelings of somebody that I love. I, I won't say that. But now they don't understand that. Something makes them mad and they lash out and that's just how it is. Again, it is your job to guide them and give them the tools and give them the language to understand that because at a certain point, like words like mean, nice, cruel, uh, kind, th those words don't mean anything to them. So you have to help them understand. But again, your kid's not going to go to hell for being a kid, for acting like a child. Like, if you're a religious person, your kid's not going to go to hell because they take something off a table when you told them no, or they don't come immediately when you call them. And I feel like this is setting us up for a lot of, again, fear-mongering and... Uh, kind of ingraining the No Greater Joy Ministries brand, which is their company, into your life of like, ah, aren't you worried about your kid's salvation? You better like buy all our stuff. You better follow our Facebook page. You better go to our blog because we're going to give you the tools to make sure that your kid doesn't go to hell. And if you don't follow what we say, you run that risk. A lot of repetitiveness about when a kid is morally accountable. And then there's two more sections left. This one's called In My Hands. The clay formed into a vessel of dishonor was marred while in the potter's hands, only to be remade into a vessel of honor fit for the master's table. If God is the potter and your child is the clay, for a little while you are the wheel on which the clay is turned. As Adam and Eve were given a garden to dress and keep, you have been given a loan of a little heart and mind to dress and keep. There will come a time when your children must stand alone before the tree of knowledge of good and evil. As the purpose of God has permitted, inevitably they will partake of the forbidden fruit. Now, in the developing years, you can make a difference in how they will respond after they have eaten. All the events of daily life coupled with inner discernment are laying a foundation of knowledge from which your child will make judgments about right and wrong. Somewhere on that road, each child will round a bend and with the dawning perceive his or her responsibility, duty, and accountability to God. Then they will be without excuse. AKA at that point, they, they don't have the excuse of not being morally accountable, so their salvation's at risk. My question is, when your kid faces moral dilemmas, 
what kind of attitude do you want them to have? Do you want them to be fearful or scared or make decisions based on what they think will please you? Or do you want them to be confident and feel secure and have the tools and equipment to think critically for themselves about what they believe is right and wrong? Personally, I, I would choose the latter. I want to, again, raise kids that are confident and loving and kind and capable of thinking for themselves, who will make those decisions based on what they truly believe, rather than kids who are just scared and anxious and worried all the time because they grew up with you wearing a PVC pipe around your neck as a reminder that one wrong move and they're going to get swatted. That's, that's where I stand. I want my kid to feel like they are fully consenting in their faith, to feel like they know what they are buying into when they choose a religion. Obviously, I think most parents would want kids to choose the same religion as them because it is a very communal thing and a lot of holiday traditions are centered around your religion and it would be really great to partake and participate in that. But I would think that you would want your kid to be fully excited and involved and invested in their faith because that's what they want rather than doing it out of fear or doing it out of some obligation. I, I don't like the shame and the fear and the scaring people into making decisions that you want them to make. And then this last part I will just read because it it's where the title of the book comes from. So they're kind of having this this moment of like, ah, see where we got our inspo from? With this understanding, we can better appreciate what is taking place in our developing child. Just as the child Jesus grew in wisdom and knowledge, so your child is going through a growth of understanding. The Holy Scriptures are able to make him wise unto salvation. You must prepare your child to save him from this untoward generation, Acts 2.40. God has a stereotype for the finished product. It is that we might be, quote, conformed to the image of his son, Romans 8, 29. We parents work with God toward the day when our children will be conformed to, quote, the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, Ephesians 4, 13. The promise of God is still operative. Train up a child in the way he should, or quote, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it, Proverbs 22, 6. And with that, I just kind of have like one last thought. I, I don't think you can ever guarantee that a child will turn out a certain way. Again, every person is different. And sure, it's, you know, it, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to instill specific values or morals or scruples in a child. You know, if, if you think there's a specific way to live your life or be a good person or there's just a certain foundation you want them to have, of course, give that to your child and uh, hopefully, you know, they do want to stick with that moral behavior. Hopefully they do, but there is no guarantee. And by doing the things in this book, I would honestly think that you lessen your chances of that happening. Because I think that there are a lot of people who were raised in an environment like this or even maybe brought up with the with the fundamentals in this book and because of this book walked away from their faith or walked away from a specific church. I think this book has made a lot of people open their eyes to the harm that can be done by these extreme fundamental beliefs. And so nothing in this book is going to guarantee 100% a specific outcome. But you know what I will say, if somebody read this book and decided to walk away from the church that they were in or walk away from a specific sect of Christianity, all the better because there is a lot of damage and harm that comes from these fundamental sects that I do not want anybody to go through. So, uh, you know, maybe thank you to the Pearls for writing this if it opened people's eyes, but also not thank you because it this, this book itself caused a lot of harm. What I'm trying to get at is there is no guaranteed outcome for anything in this life. I'm going to say this as we continue going through this series, but your child is their own person. They're going to have their own thought process, their own belief system, their own wants and desires, and you need to respect that in them. I do not 
understand the thought process of having a child for them to just be completely obedient little robots that you train into doing nothing but making you happy. I think that is incredibly selfish. And as a parent, your job is to love your kid unselfishly. Your job is to love your kid no matter what. Like I said, if you have a belief system or you have your own code of ethics or code of conduct that you personally abide by, of course, you think that is right, and so you want that for your kid. But no matter what, you love your kid. You do not have children to love them under certain conditions, under the specific condition. You do everything I say or you get hit. You don't do that. And I'm going to get angry because over the past five months, I have seen a lot of selfish love. And I get it. People are flawed. Nobody is perfect. Sometimes your own desires, just you want to you wanna go with your own desires over what might be best for a child. But at the end of the day, as the adult, it is your job to love that child, to take care of them, to do what is best for them because they have no one else to do that for them. They rely on the adults in their lives to love them, to take care of them, to look out for their best interests, and to give them the best chance to thrive. You are an adult. You're grown. You can make your own choices for your own life. You have that power. Your kid should not grow up being scared of you. Your kid should not grow up being afraid that if they don't live up to your standards of perfection, that you don't love them. Your kid needs room to make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. Adults, adults need room to make mistakes. But the difference is if you're an adult and you make a mistake, the only person that can punish you like, is you. Yeah, you, you might make a mistake and your friend might be mad at you, but you presumably have the tools to work that out with the friend. You make a mistake at, at work. Your boss isn't going to come up and punch you in the face for making a mistake. You might get in trouble. You might get talking, talked to. You might go on like, you might get like a warning from work, whatever. But your physical safety and sense of security is not going to be challenged in most cases. For kids, if you are spending every day using physical punishments on them, like there's an example of... um a little baby who's sitting with his dad and sees mom walk past and wants to go to mom. And so the dad spends an hour spanking his butt every time he tries to put a leg over to go to mom. Dad spends an hour. I don't understand the justification in that. I don't understand how that's right. You know, it, it's one of those things where I was thinking about it and I'm like, look, if the mom's been with that kid all day and the mom needs time to herself and that is why you are preventing the kid from going to mom. Okay. Yeah. But like, don't spank your kid for an hour while they want to go see their mom. If the mom's just like hanging out and is okay with the baby coming to her, it's not a power move on the baby to try and get away from you. It's most likely, if they're in these fundamentalist sex, it's most likely that the baby spends most of the baby's time, most of his or her time with the mom. And so they're excited to see the mom and they want to go to mom because that's who they spend most of their time with. That's who they're most familiar with. That's my main caregiver. I want to be with mom. If you want your kid to be excited and want to stay with you, maybe don't spend an hour swatting them. Maybe uh, distract them with something fun. All right, I'm done ranting. I'm going to uh, sign off here, go finish my glass of wine. I literally didn't even drink half of it. So I'm going to go do that. I'm going to finish my wine and enjoy some quiet before Rick and the kids get home because then all chaos will break loose. Um, I think I'm probably going to maybe do like two weeks on, one week off for this. I'm still kind of fleshing it out, but I don't want this to be like the train up a child channel. Um, I want to throw some other stuff in there as it's happening. Maybe looking into the Josh Duggar stuff. I know a lot of people have been talking about that. Uh, God is Gray recently 
did a video with Fundy Fridays who um, somebody mentioned them in my comments section. I was like, I've never actually watched a Fundy Fridays video. So I'll check that out. So I watched the video that God is Gray did um, with Fundy Friday and it was really good. Brittany Dawn is full force coming in with her religious beliefs and I think that they're very interesting. So if you want, we can talk about that. But yeah, if, if there's anything you want me to talk about, feel free to leave it in the comments section down below and I will be happy to take a look at it and might even make a video on it. While you're doing that, if you consider liking this video or subscribing to my channel, that would be incredible. And if you have subscribed already, thank you so much. I am so appreciative of you and I love being able to just sit here, hang out with you and talk about whatever. So that being said, I'm going to go ahead and let you go. Thank you so much for watching. Please be kind to people and I will see you in the next one. Bye.